Thank you, Adam. Thank you very much. And well, I'm I'm happy to be a guest in Prague today. I've not been in your country physically for a long time, but digitally, I'm enjoying everything with you together. Um, right, right this evening, um, I'm giving you some brief information about the influencer marketing markets uh, in Germany tonight, and I'm trying to focus um, as well on the perspective of potential employees who are providing services in this market as i'm trying to deep a very a little bit inside the perspective of influencers too um, well the art of using others others ideas to achieve more the title of my presentation which you see here uh, it's a short funny story um, you introduced me already. My name is Sasha. I, I founded an academy, not an agency, an academy uh, a couple of years ago, which is only dedicated to influencer marketing. And I did this after founding one of the first internet web agencies, uh, which built websites for famous customers like Gentleman's Quarterly GQ magazine or T-Mobile. Um, um, or um, some car manufacturers in the late 90s. So from, from, from web generation one to web generation three, and it's a big jump. Uh, I'm doing this since uh, 2016, 2017 now, and it appears like the whole market has changed its perspective from contracting traditional agencies to uh, our, our media to fulfill marketing uh, duties towards uh, contracting one of approximately 150,000 people living or working in Germany or uh, being available for the German market, so, so uh, calling themselves social media influencers. So what are we doing as an uh, academy? We are uh, basically providing education to business leaders. Um, I just went into a stepstone today and here you can see it. it's just from this afternoon. I entered influencer marketing uh, and influencer relations manager. And in total, just on step, uh, StepStone, we have 15,000 pending jobs today uh, where people who have certain ex expertise in the field of influencer marketing work for brands, for agencies, or for influencer networks. Plus, I would say two times more, which are not on StepStone and just advertised on those employer pages themselves. We have approximately 150,000 influencers in uh, Germany, and we are providing a companionship for those influencers because each and every influencer is a founder, is running a startup as a solopreneur, uh, running his own business or creating a, a small company, a small enterprise with what we've seen up to five, up to 10 employees, uh, which are selling, which are uh, running promotions, which are mainly producing content. Um, and we are very happy. We are in a very good situation in Germany because the uh, federal government uh, is recognizing uh, social me media uh, experts and uh, social media influencers as a substantial, very important uh, well, source of knowledge. And uh, therefore, we, we can... Uh, in some cases, deal with up to 100% state, state subsidies. That means that some federal organizations in Germany are paying for education, which we provide as well to employees of companies or agencies as to influencers who want to found or who want to grow. Uh, our academy is part of a larger organization, which is called uh, Ecomex, uh, Ecomex Business Academy. Uh, we all started uh, in the early 2000s in Berlin, and uh, we are now uh, active in whole Germany. And when I say now, is this means we have uh, physical um, education centers in a couple of cities in over 15 locations. But of course, uh, due to COVID, uh, we also provide online trainings uh, with more than one, one and a half thousand uh, people uh, each year, most of them one by one. Yeah, a, a short view here on the media echo we received since uh, 2017 for Influencer Marketing Academy. 
Um, I can say that also media in Germany is very open and interested in uh, connecting uh, and making the links between social media influences and their own platforms, meaning TV, radio, and print. And uh, one funny occurrence I had was uh, in the end of 2018, I met the current Secretary of Finance of the German federal government, uh, Mr. Lindner in German Bundestag, where we had a prime time broadcast about how to educate politicians in influencer marketing. And I guess it worked because today he's Secretary of Finance. Plus, we have a lot uh, in different media about how much is an influencer earning or how much do I have to pay for influencer marketing. And these are points uh, I would like to refer today so that you also have an insight how good the influencer marketing market in Germany possibly is for you um, as, as an employee or as a startup. When we speak about influencer marketing, um, and I'm giving those lectures, I'm giving presentations, as I said, since many years, I'm often a little bit confused because many people think that there are only um, eight major platforms, TikTok, Snapchat, YouTube, Pinterest, uh, Twitter, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, and Instagram. But that's not true. Uh, of course, like in all of your countries, uh, it is the same in Germany. We are providing content uh, through influences uh, to around 200 different social networks. And we are reaching around 3.8 up to 4 billion people which are consuming news on those platforms. And one example here on the right side is an example of a social media platform which you might not have uh, primary in, in, uh, in the top of your mindset. It's Unsplash. Unsplash is very frequently used in order to distribute branded photography through apps into dozens of uh, viral campaigns which run uh, user-based um, when you, for example, create something on um, Over or on Mojo. All those apps are retrieving images and if you put in on the other, on the other side images with your brand like uh, Yamaha is doing here, KTM is doing, a lot of bicycle producers are doing, you uh, promote your brand and you strengthen your brand. Why are we talking about influencer marketing today and why don't we speak about programmatic advertising? Why don't we speak about placing ads in print media? Why don't we speak about cinema? Um, I would say that influencer marketing is existing since at least 2000 years, but the media changed. And we are currently experiencing a giant change in how uh, the, the public is um, using media, how media reception works. If you look in the German market, we, we are losing more and more print circulation in formerly famous print publications for younger target groups up to 20 and up to 30, those people don't read anymore because uh, we have a lot of psychological studies that say that trust in journalists decreased, especially in generation Y, late Y, Z, and generation alpha. In Germany, we have a special situation about the quality of TV programs. Although there should be enough money, it is by far not as versatile as I see it in Eastern Europe or in many other countries where we have more younger formats. So statistics say that the age group 50 plus is mainly consuming uh, TV and very young kids are, but not the very strong consumers between 15 and again, 25 or 30. And at the same time, when we use social media, just as a social media manager, which is employed in a company, we have huge competition. We have a couple of 100,000 stories per minute, which are published. We have 200,000 uh, tweets per minute. We have 500 hours videos uploaded on YouTube per minute. And we all fight for relevance. And this is um, exactly the point where we try to, to help our customers. How can we uh, strengthen relevance in this big competitive market? And I brought you an example today because I know you're curious to see a little bit uh, behind our curtains and to know who are we working for. And this is Sandra, Dr. Sandra Mümel, 
Uh, she ha has promoted in chemistry and she used to work a couple of years in well conventional businesses, well-known businesses. And she didn't felt well there. She said it was mainly dominated by men. We have a big uh, fompreneur, uh, female entrepreneurship movement in Germany. And she is one of the, of the heads of the fempreneur movement in Germany. First of all, she's helping other women to establish their own business. She's also helping influencers to create brands and on top of those brands sell over their channels. But she also founded maybe as a kind of a uh, best of breed example, her own business with zero money. She ran two, she ran one crowdfunding campaign and is about to run a second one and got all the money she needed in order to create a, a three product a portfolio for uh, pain-free sugaring. Uh, so it's uh, basically three products you use in order to remove hair, to get a very smooth and glossy skin and to to clean your skin and it's as well for men uh, i should say it's as well for women as it is for men um yeah and just just listen what she has to say not sure whether you can hear that so i say uh, she, she introduces herself and she has a business to business market she's taking care of and the whole business to consumer market, which she's going to reach, she's going to address via one of our partners. It's a company called Hype Auditor, which I will refer to you a little bit later. She's going to meet the business to consumer market exclusively through influencers with a campaign she has set up uh, where approximately 200 influencers are sampling her products and uh, are promoting it with two to three stories, one post, and then they get uh, discount codes for their uh, um, own communities and they get a, a commission themselves. But this is not the primary target. It's more about generating awareness around uh, pain-free sugaring. Yeah, as I mentioned, when you have the possibility to download this presentation, at least Adam has the presentation, and whenever you want to have it, uh, you are more than welcome to contact him directly, or maybe he's so kind in linking this presentation. Um, one of our partners we use in our academy, it's Hype Auditor. It's a intelli artificial intelligence-based software platform that helps to find data about almost each and every influencer we have in the whole world and also in Germany in real time. And uh, you can run your research, but you can also directly outreach those influencers and contact them. And um, we've checked what is going on in Germany for you today so you, that you have a most current overview about that. And um, well, let me start. Half of uh, the TikTok users we have in Germany are under the age of 24 and approximately half of the Instagram users is aged between 25 and 35. And this means what you already expected, I guess, and what is not different in your country. TikTok is younger than Instagram. 68% um, of marketing specialists we have in Germany believe in influencer marketing and they are committed to run influencer campaigns on Instagram. And why are they doing it? Because of a very good earned media value. That means that they return for $1 invested in their campaigns, they receive a return of approximately $5. So in other words, if they would have to pay for what influencers contribute to their business, they would have to pay five times more they pay today. So it's really cost efficient for them. Um, the majority of TikTok and Instagram, Instagram creators in Germany are nano-influencers. Uh, although Germany within European borders seems to be bigger than most of the other countries or is among the biggest, it means it does not mean that we have the biggest influencers talking about their followership. We have most of our influencers uh, are counting only 1,000 to 5,000 followers and we call that nano influencers um, you see on the next page what what uh, what other categories we have and those nano influencers are at the same time if we speak about instagram 
the most profitable partners you can, can collaborate with because on Instagram, nano influencers have a very strong bonding uh, to their community. And it means when you run a campaign there, then exactly those nano influencers give to their community what they would expect. And this is having a good friend, having someone on their side who gives a recommendation. It's completely different on TikTok. On TikTok in Germany, mega influencers are more popular. That means accounts which are fairly big. And here you see the naming uh, we are using and you are using, I guess, too. <clears throat> so nano is one to five and mega is above one million. So in this segment, we prefer running campaigns for TikTok. And in this segment, we prefer running campaigns for Instagram in Germany. There are many, many more statistics. If you click this link, you uh, can check yourself. You can get a trial and there you see, for example, what are the most followed influencers with a good quality of uh, audience or the most connected to luxury. And you can see exactly um, how big is their German fellowship, what kind of uh, brand affinity has this fellowship, and uh, also how the growth developed and is it is it a real growth or is it a fake growth approximately 10 percent of the german influencers buy followers or buy likes and of course it is not recommended to you collaborate with those uh, partners because the quality of feedback you will receive for your own channels uh, will not be the best some more structural data. Distribution of Instagram influences by categories in Germany. Of course, like in all other countries, lifestyle content has the lead and we must see that we are speaking about 21 figures. This is a Corona year, a COVID year. So travel was not a top topic. Uh, it is music in Germany. Most content creators we had in Germany last year did something around music followed by photography, lifestyle, beauty, family, literature in Germany, uh, journalism, and the great topic of modeling, what I also appreciate as a photographer. So this is the category we have, category listing and ranking we have uh, in Germany in regards of what are the influences the creators doing. And here we see what does the community want? What is the community, which kind of content is the community um, consuming and um, the most trending topics, the topics with biggest growth rates were last year finance and economics and do it yourself and design. So it's interesting that on the one side we have saturated markets talking about the influences which are providing on the others. We have clear signals that content helping people in different life situations and uh, content helping people to balance out mind, soul, and real life is appreciated. If we look at the most talked about brands on Instagram in 21, this list for me, and I guess also for you, does not reflect my anticipation I had. I thought there were completely different names, but actually Ideal of Sweden, uh, what is a, an accessory company and Naked Fashion runs the runs the game and this shows that the influence from abroad towards the German market often is stronger than the influencer activities which is coming today from within the market and this is typical for Germany we are a little bit conservative when it comes to social media we have a little bit of time lag like of let's say two or three years uh, to to the United States and to Asia uh, in Asia, for example, uh, live casts are much more common, are much more popular. In America, we have Amazon Live. In Germany, we still have shopping TV or in TV formats. And I think we will have something accordingly in two to three years. What is a company usually paying for an influencer campaign? Or the other way around, what can an influencer in Germany earn? We have, uh, like all the other uh, 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 countries, we have a, a measuring unit called uh, per milk price. In German, it's TKP, 1,000 contact price. That means 
you pay a certain amount per thousand followers. This is a very, very rough price I'm giving you here. And it can vary extremely up and down because it depends on how big is the percentage, for example, of audience in the country you are trying to target? How good is the quality of the followers? We have very detailed rating systems in Hype Auditor, uh, like credit rating, where an A is very good, and then we go up the alphabet, and when you are at an F, it is, well, you do not trust this person. We can say how, how big is the share of those different types of influencers per influencer, uh, for, uh, for, sorry, followers per influencer. But roughly, you can say that in uh, Germany, you would have to pay between 8 and 10 euro per thousand followers per post. And if there is a management or if the influencer is working in a network or if there's an agency, often there is an agency commission of 15 or 30 up to 30 percent coming on top. And of course, if you do not only buy uh, a one one shot, not only run one gig, but you buy a package or you have a kind of a long lasting relationship like we see in the gaming industry where influencers are almost employed, then of course this rate goes down uh, immensely. So this is Instagram and TikTok is not, not different from that. TikTok here is from Hype Auditor, you see it's more structured by the number of followers, but by the end of the day, this is also 10, uh, dollars approximately what is eight dollars uh, eight euro fifty per thousand and it's uh, decreasing a little bit by size i i don't have that much time today here obviously but let me give you a short insight what could be a benefit for you if you come to germany or if you work remotely for german companies and we love people who have good language skills because often germany like you can hear uh, on, on how I speak English, we are not the best educated people uh, in regards of languages. Um, you could have a career in uh, different areas. First of all, you could be, of course, an influencer marketing manager in a marketing department or in an agency. That means this job is called influencer marketing manager or influencer relationship manager or influencer relations manager. If you and you all, I guess, have LinkedIn, and if you uh, create a job box there on LinkedIn, I personally, I get about five to 10 offers per day from larger brands and from small brands with a lot of, uh, of power, financial power, uh, which are looking for those people. Those people are the gatekeepers between the product managers, uh, the communications experts, and the big mass of 150,000 to 200,000 influencers, they look for the right influencers, so it's about selecting them. They run research on what competitors are doing. They are setting up campaigns. They are creating briefs. They are also creating events to create relationships between the influencers and the company. And they take care of uh, tracking, analytics, and payments. Another uh, job is influencer producer or project manager or consultant. Um, you can do this job directly being employed for an, an influencer or you can work for influencer networks uh, where you get appointed as a freelancer or you can work for agencies or for example for gaming producers where e-gaming producers or esports producers they are uh, well known for employing uh, so-called casters. You can become an influencer coach. This is if you want to become an influencer coach, coach, call me. You have my email address in the beginning of this presentation. I'm sure you will find me on the media. Contact me. We are searching for a lot of influencer coaches which help other influencers or which help marketing managers to turn into influencer relations managers. Influencer business advisors or tax advisors or lawyers, we have a very special, dedicated, very finely, uh, fine, finely granulated uh, tax system in Germany, as some of you might know. And it is always important, especially when you receive uh, advertising payments from the United States or when you get commission from, from abroad uh, or also from within the com uh, country that you, that you are accurate and that you are 
on the edge with your um, bookkeeping and many conventional uh, tax advisors or lawyers don't have competencies in this field. So if you have competency, you can work for them to enlarge their spectrum of business. And last but not least, to more possibilities, local and regional influencer marketing for trade or brands. Newspapers die, but newspapers have a big reputation in their city, in their regional environment, and they could better connect to influencers and integrate them into their media. This is just one of many um, digital transformation business sectors where influencers can, well, improve the future perspectives. This you could do, or you could, and this is uh, one of the highlights among investors, you could be help building or improving platforms which bring people together, influencers and brands, more or less automated and uh, as easy as possible. The last topic I would like to address today is the legal framework for influencer marketing in Germany. I've heard about great achievements, especially in Scandinavia, where influencers have to be socially insured for the time they are running campaigns. It's a real pity that we do not have this in Germany by today. But what we have in Germany is a very complex uh, and very heavily discussed um, labeling culture. Uh, but the good thing is that we have an authority, it's called Media uh, Authority, Medienanstalten. Um, if you click on the first link of this page, you get a wonderful PDF in English and in German, if you're interested, which tells you when do you have to write at or not. Because whenever you target the German market, you must declare commercial um, posts where you either earn a commission or where you get a fee or a present, you must declare them as an ad. Uh, we have one of the strictest uh, court cultures and, and uh, law cultures in the whole world. I think we have much too much lawyers in Germany, but they somehow need to earn their money. So I'm very sure when you are not doing that, there's an extreme high probability uh, that you will be pulled to court or that you get very expensive letters where, which you have to sign and where you have to uh, pay already a couple of hundred thousand euros, hundred or thousand euros, um, and guarantee not to miss this labeling. So be very careful with labeling correctly. And it's also, I think, eth ethically very good you do it because uh, other people see when you get money and they will not be, they will not hate you for that. People on social media are grateful for having a good friend and they understand when you earn because the social media platforms as such, also in Germany, do not pay good enough. And there's a, a lot of uh, effort they have to run in the close future in order to share their own revenues with the content creators. So this is labeling. Um, I just would like to point your attention to four further points which could run you into trouble. One is bogus self-employment. In Germany, we have a law that you cannot issue an invoice and you cannot be a freelancer when you just work for one contractor. So you really have to have at least two or three contractors uh, or you have to exclude a certain risk being, a, um, being a, an agency um, and contracting and influencers, a certain risk of being this one and only. Uh, because if you miss this and if you do not exclude this risk, you might be obliged to pay social security payments for this person who is uh, this, in this bogus self-employment. Next is competition law. We have, as, as, as I said, because we have so many lawyers, competition law means Better do not show other brands, better do not make compar comparable advertising and always think about when you run a campaign as a company and you ask an influencer to do something on court, it could be an interpretation that this, what the influencer is doing for you comes from you and it's not the opinion of the influencer himself. So this could run you into competitive trouble, which can be excluded with a contract. Then we have trademark law and we have tax fraud. Tax fraud means that the influencer has to guarantee you that uh, all these VAT things and 
uh, this money he receives that this is correctly reported to tax authorities uh, and also there we have a lot of people employed in germany so uh, especially when you give presents to influencers make sure that they issue an invoice for a present that costs more than 30 euro this is a 30 something euro is uh, um is um the the well, the border where from, from which you have to pay tax and you cannot get anything uh, above that without running into trouble. And as an influencer, when you get a handbag that usually costs 5,000, you don't have to pay, but you can keep it. Don't do that in Germany without an invoice and tax set. Yeah, all those risks are summarized in a contract you can buy on our website. Our website is influencermarketingacademy.de. I also put this link here into the presentation. So when you're interested, feel free to go there. And uh, last but not least, I would like to mention our June campaign. Uh, we have first TV coverage about this in late May. Um, what we learned in the past years is that there's a lot of pressure on influencers because they have to post multiple times daily. They have to produce very good content and they have to open up their private life quite a lot for that. And on the other side, there's a high expectation also on people running influencer campaigns because there's no guarantee of success. And often the expectations from today's managers or company leaders are way, way, way above what is realistic and they cannot wait long enough because also social media has a certain kind of latency time. And for this reason, we have created uh, an initiative which we call reverse and delete, uh, where we say, people, let's be realistic and let's bring uh, the psychological topics around influencer marketing on the desk and let's try to find a good balance between mind, body, soul, and likes. And with having said this, I would like to thank you for having been my audience today. I hope I could, I, it was possible for me uh, to give you some info or at least to bridge the time to uh, the next speech and a nice and, uh, well, nice and uh, calm and uh, relaxing evening. Uh, feel free to connect to me. You find me on LinkedIn, you find me on Insta, you have my email address, Sasha Schultz, DE is my website address. Uh, I am ready to answer your questions and I would like to give back uh, the microphone to Adam. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> if we May, may I start with one question uh, uh, before I'll ask the audience? Uh, we've heard that that in you know the among the topics you've mentioned as as the risks, uh, how it is that s I, I, we've heard about uh, uh, some some case in court that. Uh, influencers were basically in a way not allowed to even you know claim they have a favorite brand big even if the brand doesn't you know pay them anything uh, I think the if I'm not mistaken was it coca-cola uh, and how, how do you perceive this or how, how would how was this uh, what's the result of this case yeah I think you got it over media, right? Sorry? You you read it somewhere in the media, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's that's you know, that that was kind of uh filtered three times, but it actually gets to check press. So uh <laughs> I can tell you it's amazing the... how how much lobbyism is behind reporting um if it comes to this topic. If you think about the big publishing houses or the commercial TV stations, they used to get all the money that is today more and more flowing towards the influencers. And what they try is to make their life as difficult as possible. And those court cases are a good example. The link I've included in the presentation leading you to a PDF from an official German authority, Landesmedienanstalten, 
tells you exactly when you have to write advertising or not. And it, it's not only there since the different court cases we had, or the Coca-Cola case, or the soccer wife case. It is there since years. And um, if you get money, or if you get any kind of a financial benefit, directly or indirectly, then you have to write ad. But if you have a, a beloved brand, yeah, if you are a big fan of uh, whatever, uh, and you go to a store, you buy yourself, and uh, you just want to recommend it to your friends, then you, of course, don't have. And this is this um, way of reporting uh, in the media. It leads to a big, big uncertainty among German influencers. And sometimes they say, uh, they write something like, this is not an ad because above. Uh, they, but what also already kills uh, 50, 60 uh, characters of a limited amount of characters they have. So it's not as complicated as it sounds in media, Adam, uh, but it is a serious topic. And as we have so many lawyers, everyone seeks uh, uh, for a possibility to make money with this. Okay, uh, any questions from the audience here? Camille or anybody else? Yeah, okay. Hey, how are you doing? Uh, thanks for the talk. I do have a question. I mean, if you work with the, uh, with the bigger companies, uh, they're very tight uh, with the regulations, right? Uh, they, uh, you know, they know what to do. They, they, they know what not to do. They have a thick manuals. Do they put any restrictions on the message the influencer, uh, uh, you know, tries to carry on? And, uh, you know, is there uh, some sort of a control process over it? Yeah, yes and no. It depends on the company. There are very big companies which um, do not control the content of the message. But most companies, uh, what they do is um, they make a written agreement, uh, either with the agency or with the influencers themselves, what, which already includes a certain framework. Either it sets them free of risks uh, if an influencer does not follow regulations, but usually they ask influencers explicitly to follow regulations. This is point one. Second is, um, it's more a way that they say, this are our do's, this are our don'ts. For example, if you, if when we used to run uh, campaigns for breathing masks during COVID, right? Uh, a don't would have been in this brief to say that it is a medical mask with filtration capabilities when it just simply not works. So it, it's more more about assuming what could an un, un, exper, inexperienced uh, influencer who is not an advertising professional, what could come up in his mind and what could he connect to the message just because he might want to stand out among other influencers or what, maybe he wants to have a better conversion and we include this in don'ts. In about um, 30, 40 percent of the cases, we see that there are feedback loops. And I'm not a big fan of that, where the company, the contractor says, we have this with big hotel chains, before you publish, please send it for approval to us. And this must be, must be done very, very carefully. If you are too pushy with that, especially when you work with nano-influencers, um, then they get very afraid and they try just to please you as a contract partner. But this is not the goal of an influencer. This is a goal of an advertising agency. And this is the reason why people out, uh, in the outside don't trust uh, a lot of advertisers. Uh, an influencer needs to, be, needs to spread the message more with its own aroma, with its own twist. And so don't overregulate, but make him aware. Uh, right, thanks. Uh, may I have a follow-up, you know, in terms of the nano-influencers? How do you manage this, let's say, army of these uh, nano-influencers, you know, with 1,000 to 5,000, yeah. uh, uh, you know, uh, followers? You, you know, know it, it must, must be a pretty, pretty tedious, tedious job, job, I would say. Yeah, very good question. There are three ways. Uh, either you employ very cheap helpers who run your influencer marketing, let's say students or let's say people who just left university or finished job education, so they are more or less cheap. And you can have a lot of them because when you want to make a selection of 200 nano-influencers, you need to research at least 
800 to 1,000 influencers, and not everyone is available, not everyone is a match, not everyone wants to, right? Uh, disadvantage of this is that young, inexperienced employees on the contra uh, contractor side, uh, they are very weak when it comes to controlling and when it comes to setting standards. They will always follow what the management says, and this is not a good position towards the influencers, unless those people are, have been influencers themselves. So if you want to go this way, try to hire influencers, but try to get them helpers. But it's not the best way. The second way is you try to do it with more experienced marketing stuff, and you just scale up the amount of heads in your marketing department, this will definitely lead into bankruptcy because you can never guarantee that an influencer campaign commercially pays back. Maybe you get likes, maybe you get more followers on your own channels, maybe you get awareness, but for sure you, you cannot guarantee that you can always make sales flashes and sell a million pallets and get a multi-billionaire because of cosmetic products. So not the best way. The, from my In my opinion, the best way is to use Hype Auditor or a similar software solution because there you can do everything just within one single software solution. Hype Auditor is one, then we have uh, a lot of uh, other good products which uh, work AI-based and you run research, you set auto filters, you make an outreach. That means you can contact 1,000 influencers just with the push of a button. They come back to you and you give them insights in the brief. They confirm that they take part. They send you, a, 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 um, they give you um, the right to have a real time insight of their statistics. And so you can monitor the campaign, you can analyze the outcomes and you can send the money to them. And, and there are anal analytics, a Gartner group made some and other uh, independent companies. Um, it saves you around 80% to 90% of the headcount money within your organization to use those platforms. Thank, Thank you. you. Welcome. Any, any other questions, Vashu, from your side? <laughs> uh, okay, so I think that's it. Thank you very much for joining us.